morning, everybody. It's uh, about time to uh, start for the day. So I'll just keep talking as people start to get settled down in their seats. We'll get there. It's always the worst job to tell everyone to quit being friendly and having a good time, but someone's got to do it. Um, <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. Uh, glad you're all able to be here with us. Uh, and uh, we don't have a, a video for this morning, uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our singing. Uh, we'd sing and, and be happy. And as we sing this, uh, we just think uh, of the joy that we're able to have to be here with each other, uh, the relationship that we have with, with God and with our, our family through Him. So let's sing. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray, song will be I need thee every hour. And as we sing this, let's just uh, take some time to meditate on our, our need, our reliance and dependence uh, on God and all that he does for us. Let's sing. I need thee every
bit of a slower two songs, um, and this one as we get our minds ready for the Lord's Supper. Uh, I would say at this time also it might be during the song, if you don't have the Lord's Supper, the cup's up front, uh, raise your hand, and uh, Derek, if Derek sees anyone, uh, he'll come bring you some. Um, but wanted to do uh, that last song and this one as we think about and get ready to take the Lord's Supper together, be still and know. Uh, the last two, two weeks for sure have been ups and downs uh, in so many areas of our lives, a lot of, of hectic news, a lot of confusion, uh, which you think we'd almost be used to after the last two years, um, but it doesn't ever seem to be something at least that I, I get used to, and you might, might be the same. Uh, so I, I wanted us, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, to just take a time in the midst of all the chaos that we experience week after week, month after month, um, just to, to stop and think about the surety uh, and the foundation and the relationship that we have with God and His people. So let's sing Be Still and Know uh, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together. Be still and know Uh, will you pray with me for uh, the bread? God, our Father, we have so many things here uh, that we can just truly, truly be thankful for, for uh, today. God, there are just so many blessings that, that we have that we just take for granted every day. Um, and just help us to to take in this morning, just the truest blessing, which is a personal relationship with you in salvation that can only be achieved through the love that you have given us, through the sacrifice of Jesus, uh, to have that one-on-one -on -one connection. We don't have to go through any sort of medium to have a relationship with you. God, as we reflect on that, just help us to, to really just try to embrace that love that we feel today. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. God, our Father, as we continue our prayers, we ask that you would allow us to, to deeply reflect on, on, the, on the fruit of the vine, which does represent uh, the blood that was shed. 
garden of of all the ways to to go about successfully completing a a, a perfect plan which you set forth the the pain that was felt and the and the blood that was shed for us just set in forth set in place just this this beautiful plan for us god as we as we have pain we have strife in our life just know that help us to remember that we are eternally grateful for the ultimate sacrifice that was given for us in the life that we gain through that physical loss god help us to to be the ones to show others that love and to help others know that the sacrifice was meant for them too. In your son's name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing The Battle Belongs to the Lord uh, before the scripture reading, sermon, and uh, Zelda wants to be up here today. Go to cow time, uh, three, three through third grade. Uh, can exit during the song, and then we'll have our, our scripture reading. Um, but as we think about the Lord's Supper, as we've talked about the chaos and the stability, uh, I want this also to be a reminder that because of the stability and foundation that God gives us, uh, we are able to go out into the world uh, and be those who uh, live for for Christ, uh, and, and knowing that He is stable and grounded. And, and the victory. So let's sing The Battle Belongs to the Lord. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. The weapon of passion against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we see glory.
Scripture reading this morning will be from uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Again, that's 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for, it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Morning, family. You know, the uh, 1964 Broadway musical, Fiddler on the Roof, is about the challenges of Jewish life in Tsarist Russia some 120 years ago. And at one point in the play, Model the Tailor sings the song, Miracle of Miracles. I mean, you can help me with the first verse if you want. Wonder of wonders, miracle of miracles, God took a Daniel once again. Stood by his side and miracle of miracles Walked him through the lion's den Seriously? I mean, I thought at least Roger, who we all know loves miracles, would have been jumping up, standing on his pew, and belting it out. But oh well. So we've got this mid-20th century American musical about Jewish life in Russia at the turn of the century, and they slip in a reference to an event from Persia 2,500 years ago. Somebody was all mixed up. Now, the creators of that particular musical weren't alone in alluding to the biblical narrative of Daniel in the lion's den. 2019, not that long ago, the progressive metal band Dream Theater made a reference to Daniel in the lion's den in their song Paralyzed. In fact, rapper Danny Brown, pop rock group Bastille, the rock band Coldplay, post-punk The Sound, Bruce Springsteen, Bob Marley, Ricky Skaggs, all of them have songs that make reference to Daniel in the lion's den. And I don't know half those groups I was talking about. <laughs> you were about to be impressed and then, yeah, never mind. From the visual arts, one of many examples is Henry Asawa Tanner's painting, Daniel in the Lion's Den. It was accepted for display in 1896 in the Salon of the Academy of Fine Arts in Paris. And with that acceptance, Tanner became the first African-American painter to achieve international acclaim. I mean, given that the story of Daniel in the Lion's Pit has been standard fare in Sunday schools, and vacation Bible schools, almost since those programs were invented, I think it's safe to say that the encounter of Daniel with the lions is one of the most popular and widely known of the biblical narratives, which makes it kind of hard to preach on because you've all heard it before. So let's just go ahead, sing another song, and have the final prayer. Nah, I can't let Danny off that easy. So, if you will, go ahead and open your Bibles to Daniel the 6th chapter, please. Daniel chapter 6. On October 12, 539 B.C., the great city of Babylon, capital of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, was captured by the armies of the expanding Medo-Persian Empire. And with that conquest, the Neo-Babylonian Empire was effectively extinguished. The era of the Persian dominance of Mesopotamia began, just as in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2. Now, the Persians and their junior partners, the Medes, had this policy of letting conquered peoples have limited self-governance so long as they behaved themselves and paid their bills. 
The idea was that by keeping the local bureaucrats in place, it would smooth the transition to Medo-Persian rule. So King Darius the Mede, to whom was given the governance of the lands formerly controlled by Babylonia, set up a system of administration that tapped former Babylonian officials for their management expertise. Besides utilizing the first-hand experience of these officials, Darius structured the departments in a way he hoped would minimize opportunities for graft and other forms of corruption. So Daniel chapter 6, the first two verses. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give an account so the king might suffer no loss. Now, by this time, Daniel the Jew was in his early to mid-80s. He'd been taken from Jerusalem by the Babylonians around 604 B.C. when he was around 14 years of age. He was trained for three years to become a palace administrator to King Nebuchadnezzar, who was considered a political, military, and architectural genius. One of the outstanding rulers from antiquity. Not a nice guy, but powerful and capable. Daniel served Nebuchadnezzar for over four decades, rising through the ranks to become one of his most trusted advisors. Daniel survived the 23 years of political turmoil after Nebuchadnezzar died, including weathering at least two, if not three, coups. He was brought out of retirement and promoted to third in the kingdom the very night the last king of Babylon was killed. Now, we might think there's little point to a promotion that was only going to last for a few hours, given the Persian practice of leaving in place existing administrators of conquered peoples. I think that temporary promotion obviously worked to Daniel's advantage when the Medes and Persians took over. Now, Daniel had a rare blend of qualities for a bureaucrat. He was a man of integrity, diligent, conscientious, honest, capable, incorruptible. This blend of qualities was a natural result of his devotion to the living God within whom Daniel, he placed, God placed his spirit in Daniel. The problem is that these admirable character traits are anathema to those engaged in graft who want to abuse the system to their own advantage. Now you have heard me say before that even though technology changes, customs change, laws and policies change, basic human nature has been the same from day one on down through the centuries. Daniel so distinguished himself that he was put up for promotion. Jealousy and resentment on the part of Daniel's co-workers led to some very nasty office politics. Verses 3 and 4. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. You know, if anyone had a legitimate excuse for not giving their employer their very best effort, I think Daniel had one. He'd been kidnapped by the Babylonians, forced to work for them. They attempted to brainwash him. The work environment was hostile to his belief for all his non-Jewish co-workers and his bosses were idol worshipers and Daniel was not. And nothing changed on that front when the Persians took over. But Daniel was living a principle articulated by the Apostle Paul centuries later. And that principle is it doesn't matter who your human boss is. Your real boss is the Lord. Your work ethic and the quality of the job you do are part of your worship of the Lord. From Colossians 3, beginning in verse 22, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters in everything. 
and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So you're not sticking it to that jerk of a boss you have when you do a half-baked job. You're sticking it to the Lord. Hmm. I don't think that's a good idea. Well, not finding any dirt on Daniel with regard to his job performance, the conspirators figure that the only way to get a Daniel is through the one thing they knew was more important to him than anything else, his relationship with God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 warns that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And that's what happened to Daniel. They attacked Daniel at the source of his exemplary work ethic, his faith in God. Daniel chapter 6 verse 5. We'll never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. I'm going to get that stool out of the way before I kill myself. To do that, these men resorted to two of the oldest and most enduring of dirty tricks. They lie, and they kiss up to the boss. Now here's the lie, verse 6 in the first part of verse 7. So these officials and satraps went to the king as a group. They said to him, make King Darius live forever. All the officials, governors, satraps, advisors, and mayors agreed that the king should make a statute and enforce a decree. All? The officials? Daniel was one of the officials, one of the three highest, in fact. He hadn't been consulted. And you got to keep in mind that this was long before communication at the speed of light. They didn't have phones. They didn't have emails. They didn't have texting. It's extremely unlikely that this group of malcontents had actually polled all 120 of the satraps from Babylon all the way over to Egypt. I mean, letters in those days traveled at the speed of camel. And so from Babylon to Egypt, one way was a journey of five to six months. And then you got to come back the other direction with it. So I doubt that they talked to all 120. These men claimed far more support than they actually had. People don't change. You know, politicians use this lie all the time. The American people won't stand for this. Really? Which American people? It's not like we're all on the same page and united in terms of politics and values and and religion. So who are these all-Americans that they're talking about? Kids use this lie. Everybody at school has one. Why can't I? Everybody at school? Really? You've been in their homes? You know this for a fact? Even even church people use this lie. You know, I've spoken to quite a few members, and they all agree that we should have pews instead of, or have chairs instead of pews. They agree that we should have the sermon before the Lord's Supper. They all agree that you know, just whatever. Put the hobby horse in there you want. That line of bull is used frequently. Everybody I talk to. I'm ashamed to confess that I've used that line. You know, several people have approached me and expressed their concern that, you know, whatever, fill in the blanks. Several people? That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Well, what that usually means is my wife, 
and my buddy Moses. But truth is, I can't always even get Diane to agree with me. It's just not fair. Any time we try to get our own way, which is itself an unchristlike goal, the temptation is great to lie so as to misrepresent the level of support we have, which is also unchristlike behavior. Well, that's what these Babylonian administrators were doing. They didn't just lie. They schmoozed up to the boss. I mean, what was this new decree that all the satraps were wanting? The other part of verse 7. The decree should state that for the next 30 days, whoever asks for anything from any god or person except you, your majesty, will be thrown into a lion's den. Now, it's doubtful that they were encouraging Darius to temporarily promote himself to godhood for a month. I mean, neither the Medes, nor the Persians, nor the Babylonians had a history of viewing their kings as divine, unlike the Egyptians did. And if you're going to promote yourself to godhood, why only do so for a month? That makes no sense. Nor is it likely that they could have convinced Darius, a polytheist, somebody who worships many gods and goddesses, it's unlikely that they could convince him to forbid the worship of all the gods and goddesses for a month, except Darius. I mean, the last thing a polytheist like Darius would want to do is make 1,072 gods and goddesses all mad at him at the same time. That's just insane. I mean, you cut off worship to all of them even for a month. They're not going to be happy with you, and they're going to come for you. At least in his belief system. Rather, it seems to me that the conspirators were recommending that for one month, Darius become the sole mediator between gods and humans. The high priest for all the gods and goddesses, as it were. I mean, this certainly appealed to Darius's ego, but... You could argue that it makes sense on certain other levels, too. I mean, given that his administration was still relatively new, this whole idea could serve as a loyalty test and perhaps help unify the kingdom during this bumpy transition from Babylonian to Medo-Persian rule. Beyond that, in Darius's day, the average subject could not just waltz into the throne room and ask the king for a favor. You know, they had to go through intermediaries, give their petition to an intermediary. The intermediary then weighed that petition and decided whether it was important enough to bug the boss or not. All right? Looking at it that way, you can see how Darius might think, hey, if I give the gods and goddesses a vacation for a month, that they might like. You know, and I'll just receive all the petitions and I'll only forward to them the ones that I can't handle. I'm sure they'd like a break. I don't know. Whatever Darius was thinking, he was being played. And he didn't figure that out until it was too late. The conspirators had only one objective. Eliminate Daniel. I think it's a testimony to Daniel's godly way of life that his enemies knew him well enough to know he would not change his religious beliefs and practices. Else this boy would not have worked. They had faith in Daniel's faith. Which is why they sought to create a conflict between Daniel's religious beliefs and practices and local law. Think about that. And the witness of Daniel's faith. Would that we all aspire to live such godly lives that others took note of our faith in God and they knew that we would act in ways consistent with that faith. May that be one of our prayers and one of our constant efforts. We read in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, that Daniel knew the decree had been signed. 
So what are some of the ways Daniel could have handled this situation and not gotten caught? What are his options? Well, the law was for just 30 days, you know, one month. Why not take a month off of praying to God? That's one way. I mean, I don't have to talk to these fake gods and goddesses. I just won't talk to any god for a month. There. Won't get caught. You know, sometimes when I'm walking up here to the office, I'll spend that time in prayer. But I'm praying quietly to myself. My lips aren't even moving. So people passing me, they don't know what I'm doing. They just see this guy walking. Couldn't Daniel have done that? I'm just going to go for a walk and keep his mouth shut, don't move his lips. They don't know what he's doing. Why not do that? Or if you just got to pray out loud, why not keep changing the time and place you do it so they can't catch you? I mean, at the very least, close your windows. Well, as you know, Daniel didn't use any of those evasive maneuvers. Reading in verse 10, when he returned home, he knew the decree was signed, he went upstairs and he prayed in front of the window that faced Jerusalem in the same way he'd always done. He knelt down in prayer three times a day giving thanks to God. Didn't change the time, didn't change the place, didn't change the practice. Was this man getting senile? Was he naive? A glutton for punishment? No, he was faithful to his God. He trusted in his God, says verse 23, rather than in his own ingenuity. And just as Daniel's enemies could find no funny business in the carrying out of his administrative duties, he didn't want God to be disappointed in the way he handled his spiritual responsibilities. He wanted to be found innocent before God in this matter, according to verse 22. If Daniel had employed any of the evasive maneuvers we mentioned, most if not all of which probably make tactical sense to us. That's a good idea. We'll try that. He would have considered it an unfaithful act. That's right. Just walking around the neighborhood with his mouth shut, praying in his mind, would have been unfaithful in his view. Beyond that, Daniel would not let his enemies think that they could get him to change and thus compromise his witness. Well, you know what happened to Daniel next. King Darius learned too late that he'd been suckered by these sycophants. He tried everything he could find, uh, looking for this loophole in the law to get Daniel off, but he failed. No surprise there. Psalm 146.3 says, Do not place your trust in princes and human beings who cannot say. Flawed and fallible human beings produce flawed and fallible laws that will be abused by people with ill intent. It's the way it's always been, and that's the way it will always be. Daniel respected King Darius, but he never looked to Darius for protection and deliverance. He looked to God. And into the lion's den Daniel went but he didn't get at. He didn't get nibbled. He didn't get scratched. An angel of God joined Daniel in the lion pit and told the lions that they would have to spend the night fasting. Aslan said so. Darius pulled Daniel out of the pit the next morning and tossed into it the conspirators and their families. You might say that the lions fasted all night in order to feast on a non-profit organization the next morning. Well, then Darius wrote another decree. That second decree is really the key point to the story of Daniel in the lion's den. The story of Daniel in the lion's den is not about not getting eaten by lions. Daniel had no idea whether he'd be eaten or not when he went into that pit. 
Just like back in chapter 3, his three friends had no idea whether they'd be burned up in the fiery furnace or not. And remember, they said to Nebuchadnezzar, Hey, our God can deliver us from your furnace. But even if he doesn't, we still won't worship your gods. Another example is from Acts chapter 12. The apostles Peter and James were captured by Herod Antipas, put in prison. Only one of them escaped. Remember, Herod had James's head cut off and he was going to do the same to Peter the next day, but God sent an angel to break Peter out. I do not know why to this day God saved Peter but did not deliver James from the sword. Did he love Peter better? I don't think so. God never promises he'll spare us from suffering in this life. He says, I've got something better for you. No matter what happens to you here, I've got something better for you, and it's a forever thing. So Daniel didn't know. So the Daniel and Lions is not about being delivered from the lions. What Daniel and Lions is about is it's been hammering home the same theme that's been the thrust of every chapter in Daniel so far, and that is that however bad things might look from our vantage point, God really is in control. He's working behind the scenes to bring about his purposes, not our purposes, not our goals, his goal. He has an end game, and nobody's going to be able to keep him from achieving it. So here's the key point of Darius's confession concerning Daniel's God, verses 26 and 27. He is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. Now think about this in its context. You know, when the troublemakers came in, the first thing they said was, O king, live forever. Even Daniel did that when he would go into Nebuchadnezzar's you know, throne room. He'd say, O king, live forever. It was a courtesy in that day, time, and place. But no one really believed that Nebuchadnezzar or Darius would live forever. But God is forever. He does live forever. Daniel was there the night the Neo-Babylonian Empire ended and the Persian Empire began to expand its borders into Mesopotamia. He saw one kingdom crumble. Here comes another. But as Darius said, God's kingdom will never be destroyed. God endures forever. His kingdom is forever. And that's why we should seek God and put Him first over shifting earthly kingdoms and alliances. I mean, think about Daniel's own 80 plus years on the planet. His childhood was spent in the independent kingdom of Judah ruled by righteous King Josiah who was killed by Pharaoh of Egypt. As a teen, Daniel saw his nation crumble in the onslaught of the Babylonian juggernaut. He lived through the golden age of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, seeing with his own eyes one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, built by Nebuchadnezzar, and he saw them destroyed as well. Daniel saw off five of Babylon's kings, and the end of that empire. He was there for the rise of the new empire ruled by Persia. In his eight decades of life, those who occupied the thrones of earthly kingdoms changed multiple times. The boundaries of nations changed. The laws changed. But the one who occupies the throne of heaven, the one in whom Daniel placed his trust, never changed. And never will. And that's why Daniel could endure the trials that he faced. His allegiance was to God first and foremost. He put his faith in God, not in human systems. He relied on the Lord rather than human beings like himself. Psalm 118 verse 9 sums it all up. 
it is better to take refuge in the Lord rather than trust in earthly rulers. Did you hear that? Did you understand it? Daniel embodied that, which is why he endured through so many trials. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in earthly rulers. May we take that message to heart and live it out in our own lives. In a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing Miracle of Miracles. No, we're not going to sing Miracle of Miracles. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. Uh, it's a prayer that when we come to the hour of trial, we won't cave. That the Lord will be there with us and strengthen us in our trial. And as we sing that song, you're welcome to... If you have any need today, a praise to share or a struggle you're going through that you covet the prayers of your brothers and sisters on, then we want to take the opportunity to pray with you and for you. If you want to know more about this God who endures forever and actually controls history, even now, he's still in control. And if you want to know more about him and how to enter into a saving relationship with him and become his child, we'd be happy to sit down with you and open up the word of God and let it show you how to, how to have that relationship. Now you can either come up here as we sing and I'll visit with you and share what you want shared with your family. Or as we get up, Mike and Terry Griffin are going to head out these doors and they're going to go all the way down to the library, last room on the right before the double doors. You, you won't miss it. But if you want to get up and just have private prayers with, with the Griffins, then we encourage you to do that. And they'll wait down there for you and they'll be there as long as people need them to be. Will you join me as we stand and as we sing? In the hour of trial, Jesus, we
like to close with these words from Numbers, the sixth chapter. 